I'm here to talk about smart cities, open data, and SMW. So I have, let me tell you a story about it. But before I do so, um, I want to give a background about this whole logo, how it came about. So about, I think in February, Jesse gave me a call and said, oh, Joel, I guess you're being the publicity chair. <laughs> and one of the, your responsibilities, apart from trying to do publicity stunts, he'll advise maybe, is put coming up with a logo. And this is what I came up with. For the locals, I'm sure the Cardiff Cook is well known, but for those who are not from here, this is that guy, Cardiff Cook. He's about, what, seven miles south of us or something? Right? About right, yeah. By the water. And uh, he's well known. The reason I pick him is I reached out to Kristen and I asked Chris, what do you think will be a good landmark if we start making this practice of identifying a landmark with the SMW con location? He said, oh, it's Legoland or Cardiff Cook. So I said, okay, <laughs> I'm going with Cardiff Cook. And the reason why was I started looking him up. And if you look, go to that blog, you see that people are like doing mashups <laughs> on him. Like here he is, like for somebody's birthday, when Bin Laden was killed, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> when somebody's, I guess, ballerina thing, mm -hmm. as a surfer, uh, as Oprah Winfrey during her 25th anniversary as a, a host, with uh, complete with the uh, magic bra, <laughs> so, as Moses, right? <laughs> and even this big productions like uh, Jaws and. Uh, even this very complex pr production of the, you know, like, with the pterodactyl, just to, you can appreciate the scale of what kind of work went into that. And actually, I started scheming, okay, you know what, maybe we can do something similar, because I'm quote-unquote the publicity chair, let's do a publicity stunt. And we started brainstorming, and we were supposed to actually copy this whole thing and make it life science. But uh, thankfully, Tom, Dissuaded me from doing it. <laughs> <laughs> that used to be a Otherwise, I'd be in jail or something. Thought it would be a bad idea. Yeah. So it, well, you know, we didn't do it, but you know, we kept the logo. But uh, what about the, the wave, you might ask? Why did we choose that? Because it's out of copyright. No, this is a uh, public domain now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's why we can use it. This is the, the great wave of Kanagawa, which I'm sure everybody has seen at one point or another. And the reason I choose it is because, you know, we chose the tag, play with data. And I wanted to use this as a metaphor for the coming data tsunami. So if you think about it, you know, like matrix, everything is data. You know, your age, your, who you are, all your properties or your triples are, is data. So I'm thinking, hey, with SMW, we can surf the wave of data instead of just drowning in it, right? So that's the idea, that's the inspiration why we came up with this logo. Just so, and also a secret tip, if you go to the SMWCon website, there are two logos out there. If you click on the one, not the, the home one, but the, the big the, the rectangular one, if you click on it, that goes to the Cafe Press store. So if you want to get more swag, you know, like, like this shirt and stuff, you can go there and some, Money goes to the OSDA for future SMW clients. So now to the talk. So just a little background first. <clears throat> I'm actually going back two years. So I'm talking about NYC facets, the application we did. But I want to go back further than that because two years ago, we uh, participated in this thing called Big Apps 2.0. And it's basically a challenge hosted by New York City to basically expose its data and let people you know, mash, mash up, do any mashup on it. And they give some awards and recognition and hopefully they introduce the winning entrants. Like the guy, the first team that won Big Apps won. After they won, they got funded by EDC, they got some seed capital from BMW and now you know, they're in 60 countries, uh, uh, 60 cities in uh, so many countries. I forget exactly how much. And this Big Apps 2.0, so we said, you know what, let's try to do something here. And they had this thing called the NYC Data Mine, where they went around the different agencies. Uh, New York has about 120 agencies and departments. 
And <clears throat> they exposed all this data, which is well and good. It took them a while. But the thing there is they just put it up in, in a web server and then in different file formats. So once again, big apps, the main goal is transparency, Gov 2.0. And also, more importantly, at least for New York City, they're looking at it as a, a way to encourage innovation and a job creation program. <clears throat> it's patterned after Apps for Democracy, which was uh, around 2007 in Washington, D.C. It was <clears throat> started by Vivek Kundra, who was the CIO of Washington, D.C. at the time. And it got a lot of press, and they only put up a prize, I believe, of about $50,000, and they had so many submissions, which they estimate were worth a couple of million dollars. <clears throat> And basically what it does is it leverages, of course I have to get the Lego thing, crowdsourcing. <clears throat> and crowdsourcing I don't need to explain to everybody, but then there's this concept of crowdsourcing and incentivized competition, which is what Big Apps is. And hopefully the goal is you accelerate innovation. <clears throat> and it's not a new concept. Uh, if you do some research in Wiki, on uh, Wikipedia, there's this guy, the one on the top left, uh, he responded to a prize about how to navigate the, the oceans. And he came out with uh, a way to basically do lo uh, uh, longitude. People can figure out latitude, but they can figure out long longitude. So he came out with, like, with a watch. And that was in response to a prize. <coughs> uh, Spirit of St. Louis, that was also in response to a prize. And because of that, we have modern aviation, right? Which is not even 100 years ago. Then, of course, X Prize for uh, space, going to the moon. Now that the space shuttle is gone, now people are looking at the private sector, right? And even the DARPA Grand Challenge of this driverless cars were a result of this incentivized competitions. A more recent example is Netflix. This was about four or five years ago, where they wanted to improve the recommendation algorithm by 10%. So they exposed all this data, and they put up $1 million. <coughs> And within six days, a team submitted something that improved Cinemax by 1%. And that's within just six days. And all told, after, when the contest concluded, they had 20,000 teams making submissions. And all that IP now belongs to Netflix. So that's the cheapest R&D you can get for $1 million. And you have people like Bell Labs, Opera Solutions, and some well-renowned universities doing this. And if you follow big data, Opera Solutions is like one of those big guys in big data. So that was a very efficient use of crowdsourcing. So much so that shortly after that, there's a startup called Challenge Post that came about, based in New York. And one of the first things they did, one of their first customers was New York City, and they did big apps, pattern after what was done in Washington, D.C. And they're doing some other challenges for the government, like uh, Apps for Healthy Kids by the First Lady, challenge.gov, which is like a challenge portal for the federal government. And maybe Samsung, from, you, know, you know this, that you know, they have the Smart TV Challenge and all that. And Europe is following the queue. They have their own open data challenge. <clears throat> so when Obama was <clears throat> sworn in, additional background, one of the first things he did, because he ran on it during the campaign, is to sign the Open Government Initiative, which is basically saying, okay, I'm going to expose all the data. And the way he did it is he handpicked this guy, the same guy from Washington, D.C., and made him the first federal CIO. And promptly what he did is he launched all these programs, and our friends from RPI, Alums would know what these programs are. Jim Hendler and all those guys mainly ran this, right? But you would think everything's good. <laughs> Too loud. <laughs> Don't be too proud of this thing you constructed. But because of all the budget cuts last year, right, after the uh, 
2010 elections, midterm elections, there was this fight now in Washington, D.C., and people were fighting about budgets. And guess what? <laughs> <laughs> the first casualties were these programs. And actually, two, program, <laughs> two programs were canceled altogether. And everything else is on life support. And if you follow open data, that's why we've been going through this uh, parade of, I guess, CI, uh, federal CIOs, because they're getting frustrated with all the things. Because all told, what we were talking about was just eight, $34 million, which if you compare to an F-24 plane, is, I don't know if it's, that's even one wing, right? <laughs> which is like $150 million. So all those uh, programs are kind of in life support, just keeping the lights running. And that's the state of affairs in, of open data, at least in the federal government. But I'm here to talk about New York City. And uh, things are better in New York City because we have the benefit of having Mayor Bloomberg there. And after all, he's the first data geek, right, that made billions doing data for finance. And we have uh, council members like Gail Brewer, and she pushed this open data bill, which mandates that all city agencies publish their data in a format viewable by browsers and mobile devices and in their raw and processed form. So actually about two weeks ago that passed, no, uh, two months ago. So now, that's now the law in New York. And that's thanks to Bloomberg. And not only that, Bloomberg has uh, a lot of programs in place because he really wants to push New York as the digital city of the future. They even release a roadmap uh, detailing what they want to do. And one of the things they want to do is keep pushing these big apps and creating the city as a platform. Because if you think about it, government is one of the biggest producers and consumers of data. So since we paid for that data anyway, so might as well try to do something with it, right? So we created, this is Big Apps 2.0 again, just a long background. We created NYC Data Web. The company I was with, uh, I, I headed up the knowledge engineering practice, which we do semantic technology consulting. Uh, we, we partnered with uh, Revelytics. If that's a familiar name here. They're, uh, they're also a semantic technology company, and we created NYC Data Web, following these principles. So we wanted something that's cost-effective, easy to use, based on open standards, sparkle, no adoption curve, and help accelerate open data innovation. So we were, NYC Data Web was also a developer tool that we created in back two years ago. And our mantra was usable data now. For the uh, Sem Semweb geeks, I'm sure this is a familiar TED talk. <clears throat> this was during the, I think, 20th anniversary of the web. And Tim Berners-Lee gave this talk. And here's a short clip. Government department, we find that the people, they're very tempted to keep it, to have it all open data. You, you, you have your database, you don't let it go until you made a beautiful website for it. Well, I'd like to suggest that, well, before you get make a beautiful website, huh, who might say don't make a beautiful website? Make a beautiful website, but first, give us the unadulterated data. We want the data. We want unadulterated data. Okay, we have to ask for raw data now. And I'm going to ask you to practice that, okay? Can you say raw? Raw. Can you say data? Yeah. Can you say now? Right. Raw data now. Raw. And we believe that, but with a little slight twist, we think it should be usable data, right? Because if I just give you a dump of all these CSV files and a FOIA request that we were discussing, you wouldn't know what to make, how to make sense of it. So we said, you know, you need to make the data, because we almost had like that in the small in New York City, right? New York City exposed 350 data sets, and a lot of the developers didn't know. There were three months to to do the competition, and about half that time was just trying to figure out the data. So we said, let's try to make that data usable. So we said, okay, we, we, you know, everybody wanted to create that beautiful website, but we want to make the data usable. So this NYC data web. So this was the state of affairs two years ago. So all the data sets that the city was exposing was basically just files sitting on a server, and you were going to do HTTP download. 
and that, that website was called NYC Data Mine. And uh, developers who enter the contest, you know, you would expect you can just do a query and then you'll get the results back. But actually the reality was not that, but okay, now I download these files and try to figure it out myself. And it's disconnected from them, and then I create my own silo that's disconnected from the data mine. So we said there's a better way, and that's what we strive to do with NYC Data Web. So in around two months, and with 30 minutes before deadline, we made our submission. And this is what we came up with. We used Noodle as the ontology editor to create like a small subset, like I think like 20 data sets we selected in handpick. And we did a domain mapping and, uh, and uh, upper level ontology to collaborate all those data sets. And you can view this. The New York City Data Lab. So I'll just skip that. <laughs> and this basically this is what we did. So they have this product called uh, Spider, which where we did the domain mapping with the mapping ontology and Spinner, which is where we did the federation of the, the queries and then we get the sparkle back. And that front end that we used that time, the beautiful website, to create that beautiful website that Tim Berners-Lee referred to, uh, we created three, dashboard clicks, uh, three dashboards, one by Spry, which is like a sister company of Revelytics, and two by TCG, and we used SMW Plus for both of those websites. So some quick screenshots, Spry's dashboard, and this is one of the SMW Plus dashboards. This is NY Creation. Basically, we had a subset of data sets related to parks, so we did some mashups on that data. Using some different result formats. And we also, because I had two teams, one located in Kolkata, one located in Mumbai, I had them a little contest on their own, and then the, the Mumbai team created this, and they did a mashup of all the uh, restaurant <coughs> data. And also a treatment of see some of the metadata. So that was good. We submitted this 30 minutes before deadline. Uh, Big Apps 2.0 last, last year, about a week before last year's SNWCon in Virginia. And we won. We won a minor award. Uh, I'm, I'm there with uh, Reveletics guy, uh, Greg and uh, Mike Lang Jr. with uh, Mayor Bloomberg. We want this thing, large organization award. So we said, okay, now we have validation. We can now show this to other people and then we can you know, make this an introduction and do all kinds of rollouts in the enterprise, right? And that was, you know, we were in our honeymoon period. So we started planning, okay, let's do the roadmap. And the roadmap was, we'll integrate the two websites, make it one website, make it far easier so regular people can use it because it was still a developer focused tool and position it as a, almost like a platform for the other developers to build mashups too. So they can say powered by NYC Data Web when they do a submission. Right? And then on phase three, we'll bring it to other cities. So that was the thinking. And then I, around summer of last year, I told my boss, okay, let's execute this. And he told me, okay, uh, we spent all this money doing the submission and all I got is that certificate. <laughs> all I have is a certificate. So, uh, see that, okay. The Emperor does not share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that treatment from my boss. Like that, <laughs> force choke. So um, that led me to think. Uh, you know, I really wanted to do this. I, you know, I, I've been in leading the knowledge engineering practice for a while now, and I, we've been even with partnering with enterprise, with Revelytics, with some help from Vulcan, we've been having some difficulty penetrating the enterprise. We have all these pilots with all these Fortune 50 companies, but it seems that maybe for package. Uh, software, like what AI1 does, you have an easier time. But since we were doing consulting, it was so much harder because the expectation levels were so hard. Uh, were so different, you know, from, from typical enterprise software. 
and enterprise uh, uh, professional services. So I said, uh, that's how Ontoja started. So a little background. So I, I, I was getting frustrated with uh, practice, and uh, my friend Sammy, my partner Sammy, we, we got together October 4, there was this meetup in the city, we haven't spoken for a while, let's meet up in the city, and the, the meetup's name was Find Your Next Startup Partner. So we, 30 minutes into it, we started talking, you know what, we don't need to be in this meetup, uh, you're my startup partner. So we left Eight in Chinatown and started, you know, brainstorming. The following day, our idol Steve Jobs died, and you know, you saw all the press about people saying, okay, you know, don't don't follow somebody else's dream, live your own, make a dent in the universe. And then we started thinking, when about a week later, Big Apps 3 was announced, I was telling Sammy my frustration about, you know what, I, I really want to do this thing as a startup. So, a few days later, I put in my papers, and we formed Ontodia LLC. So Ontodia, uh, for the semantic web geeks here, that icon is uh, basically a giant global graph, right? So which is like the semantic web. And that's our vision. But the way you want to do it, oops. So that's what we're... A little background before I show that, is we want to bring semantics first to the mass market. Because I had, didn't have any success in penetrating the enterprise. And since you know our idol Steve Jobs died, and so we were in that frame of mind, one of the things that, uh, that struck us is this code that I'll show that right now. Right. So that's what we're about. We're about making better products. And what I love about the consumer market that I always hated about the enterprise market is that we come up with a product, we try to tell everybody about it, and every person votes for themselves. They go, yes or no. And if another one say yes, we get to come to work tomorrow. You know, that's how it works. In fact, it's really simple. As well, the enterprise market, it's not so simple. The people that use the products don't decide for themselves. And the people that make those decisions sometimes are confused. <laughs> <laughs> we love just trying to make the best products in the world for people and having them tell us by how they vote uh, with their wallet whether we're on track or not. So. So yeah, I mean, now everybody talks about this thing called consumerization of IT, right? So what happens? Your CEO comes to the CIO, I have an iPhone, I want this for everybody. Damn your firewall policies, damn whatever, your exchange server, I want my iPhone. So it's the consumerization of IT. And if you think about it, even the PCs was the consumerization of IT. Back then they had this, like, mainframes and, you know, minis, right? And then people started bringing their PCs, right? So maybe we should do something similar with, with semantics, just bring it to the masses, and once they start seeing some traction, then maybe, oh, I want that for my company. You know, and that's why maybe IBM did Watson, and maybe Siri, you know, I mean, it's not totally semantic, but look, you know, that's how they got bought up by Apple. Right? So that's one of the things that inform our, when we created Ontodia. So, but we want to, do the whole human-powered machine-accelerated collective knowledge systems. Because we thought nowadays, I really like what Tom mentioned yesterday, about this whole gamification. And I don't know if you follow uh, Clay Shirky, he came out with this uh, phrase, uh, cognitive surplus. Right? Now we're not hunters, gatherers, we don't need to worry about where we get our food. We have all these spare cycles, wetware, right? Might as well use that spare cycles, our brains, the most powerful computers there are, Instead of trying to mimic what the brain does, you know, use gamification to really inform the whole thing. Yes. Having a little trouble getting to Ontodia.com. Is that Ontodia? Ontodia. 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 Thank you. And the, the first domain that we're, we're targeting is, uh, uh, this is our smart cities, quote unquote, brand, uh, Pediasities. And it's informed by, uh, because I've been following uh, Gov 2.0 for a while, this, this, I don't know if you're familiar with Institute of the Future, every 10 years they make a prediction of what's going to happen. And they released a study, the future of cities information and inclusion, uh, about two years ago. And by 2020 they predict 
that the cities will go larger, continue at a rapid pace, and it will become a unique laboratory for experimenting with all this data. Right? Ten years ago, we didn't have smartphones. You know, the, the, the shuttle just landed in New York City. Your smartphone has more horsepower than what powered the shuttle. Right? So, what? Imagine what is is the, going to be the state of affairs ten years from now. So we think uh, we can by by concentrating on cities that have all these open data initiatives, the domain is large enough, but at the same time, it's not that big, that we can do pragmatic semantics. And I think it's, and everybody's moving to the city, right? This cool urbanization trend in China, they predict 300 million people will move to cities by 2020. That's the whole population of the US, right? And 90% of these cities are in emerging markets, and you know we're all dealing with all these things day to day. So why do something? You know, I, I appreciate a lot of people attending here. You're doing great work in in the sciences, right? But to the everyday man, these are not accept, exactly accessible and something they cannot grasp. So maybe if we make it, oh, I have this pothole, or I have this noise complaint, and all that data is there, and I want to give me all restaurants with a B rating, with a parking garage next to, next to it that has been inspected in the last 10 months, right? Maybe all that data is out there that's being exposed by the city, but maybe if we do some query federation and then allow them, give that kind of information to regular people, then maybe we'll get some traction, you know, consumer, the consumerization of semantics. <clears throat> and why NYC? Well, first of all, we live there, but uh, thankfully enough, it's a big city, it's people, it's like the de facto capital of the world. And it's second only to Silicon Valley for most startups. And one statistic that blew my mind the other day when uh, I heard Mayor Bloomberg said there are more university students in New York City than there are people in Boston. Because people think, okay, educational, Boston, you know, MIT, and all those guys. But there are more actually people people going to school, then there are a lot, the whole of Boston in New York City. Boston, you mean the city proper, right? Not Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> And also, uh, Bloomberg is making this big push to really make New York City uh, the, the innovation capital of the world as well. So I'm sure, I don't know if you heard about this, he's trying to do like an MIT Stanford type thing in Roosevelt Island. And then they passed the bill March 7th. And then just last week, they launched a wiki to solicit uh, opinion from, the, from practitioners, academics, researchers on how to do open data in the city. And I invite you guys to go there and check it out. Uh, we're hosting that site, actually. We managed to, we convinced the city uh, to switch. We, they were using a, a, a wiki I didn't know about, XWiki from France, maybe the French People know about that X wiki, some enterprise wiki, and it was just your static text type wiki. And we told them, hey, use SMW plus. It's not static text. Hmm? It can do other things. Oh, it can do other things. Yeah. Right. Right. I don't know if it can do stuff like SMW plus. Uh, it's scriptable. It, it, take a look at it. Ah, I should. <laughs> but anyway, because I'm partial, I said, hey, do SMW plus, and they bought it. Uh, and the same day. They handed out the Big Apps 3 awards, and maybe the reason why Darren was there with us to celebrate. We didn't know, we, we, but the uh, good thing is we, we did win the grand prize. <laughs> so that's a professional photographer, and even his picture is dark. So. <laughs> so that's Bloomberg. Uh, that's us getting the award. Uh, that was just last week. Um, so now, hopefully, we'll parlay this into really building what we set out to do originally, this pediacity is basically uh, like an NYCpedia. Because we only had two months to, to execute this, uh, we just concentrated on just basically compiling the metadata. Uh, so let me just do a quick run through. This is the submission video that we use for, for it. I'll just narrate through it. So New York City, they had the roadmap. So over the years, in Big Apps 1, they only had about 200 data sets. Big Apps 2, they had 350. In Big Apps 3, they had about 900 data sets. And now with the bill being passed, 
we said that that is just going to be the tip of the iceberg. Because now if all the agencies will have to publish their data, then you'll have this tsunami of data coming your way, and there was just no way to slice and dice it. The metadata was not easily available. So we said we will try to organize that, and not only organize and catalog the data of the city, but collaborate it with other data sources, like APIs, the Link Data Cloud, and some other data sources that, you know, like maybe the US Census, or some other things that may not be in the Link Data Cloud. And I'm trying to, the metaphor of <laughs> icebergs, is if you don't give them enough information, people will not know how to navigate this open data waters. You know, they need a lot of metadata. And not only metadata, they need much more than that. I'll just quickly go through this. This is why we said we, we, we created NYC facets, <clears throat> because that's huge open data. And what we do is we extracted the metadata. So of those 950 data sets, uh, it was exposed in the Socrata back website. And if you go to nycopendata.socrata.com, you'll see 900 data sets, okay? And they're all listed. They have categories, you can look at them. If there's uh, address loop information, they do maps. But then as a developer, the first thing you do when you develop a system is you look at the data, right? You get a lot of metadata to see what's there. And the metadata was somewhat hidden because it was a mix of a consumer facing and developer type resource. So we used the API that they exposed and then we called the heck out of it every weekend and we extracted as much metadata as we can and then we derived additional metadata, which we call extra metadata, using semantic statistics algorithm in the cloud. And then we do federated queries on both the metadata and the data. That was the original vision. And the uh, little marketing term we came up with that is uh, crowd knowing. So we use the crowd to inform how good the data sets are. Because what we were doing was that we created this feedback loop between people using the data, developers and the publishers, and computed some scores, uh, almost like a, think of it as almost like a Google page rank for each data set. So we computed them on several uh, perspectives like freshness, uniqueness, sparseness, you know, if the, the quality of the data, what's the rating of the crowd, are it giving thumbs down, thumbs up, how many times was it downloaded as signals to see how good this data set is. And hopefully, that signal is not only useful to the developer, but that's useful to the publisher as well. To say, okay, I think your score is very low because this. So, so that becomes like a, a, like a uh, feedback loop that hopefully collaboratively refine the data. So that's NYC facets. We're now working on this vision of, the original vision of creating this, this uh, NYCpedia of sorts. Uh, it's almost question answering, but not really. But uh, I can't really show much more than this right now, but we're working on, on, on the nyc.pediacities.com website right now. And basically the experience will be, you go there, say right now, the, the, the use case here is I open my browser and I'm in Times Square. It knows I'm in Times Square. And then it changes the skin to know, and then it changes the, the, uh, the, the breadcrumb to indicate that that's where you are, and then you can click on those things, and then you can see, if you say I click on Times Square, you see, you can see all the data around that environment that's available for Times Square, and then based on your profile, if you're a tourist, resident, business developer, or government, it changes the data sets, uh, and the, the queries that, uh, that come back, the results. So uh, that's all I have for now, thank you. Very good, very nice. Questions? Yeah, two related questions. Uh, what were the costs to New York City, especially when compared to the federal costs? Well, uh, they came out with an estimate. Right now it's a multi-stage program when the law was passed. Mm -hmm. The first milestone, milestone is to come out with the open data policy. And they estimate that will cost $1.2 million 
for the city to do the, the policy. And that's basically just guidelines, mm -hmm. technical standards on what kind of metadata, what kind of data, how to format and all that. And they just opened the wiki last week. And I invite you to go there and they're soliciting opinion mm -hmm. as to how to best do it. But the projected costs, how do they compare to the federal 34 million? And there's a reason why I'm asking that. Uh -huh. um, about 20 years ago, there was an effort to open up uh, legal opinions. Like, you know, uh, judges release opinions. And if you go to the lawyer's office, you see all these books. So it's put out by a company called West's Publishing. And they own the index numbers to those books. So you, in order to cite a legal opinion in a court, you have to use the copyrighted West's number, and West's lobbied very hard to prevent the release of federal judicial opinions. And the last I heard is they won. Uh, so the, what I'm wondering about is, is this a case of the 34 million, if the New York costs are comparable to the federal, then it means obviously it can be done. But are you getting resistance from West's or Elsevier or? It's still early days. And all the data that's being published by the city is something that they own, like 911 reports. No, no, no I understand that. But the one thing is that the, res the resistance that you got, the Darth Vader guy, um, cutting, up, cutting up on the federal, mm -hmm. uh, you may be picking up lobbyist resistance over there. And you know maybe there's no market for the New York. But the thing is that you can pioneer this, but there may be people yeah. who object to the release of the data because they own the channel now. And I'm sure they, there will be objections because it changes their business models, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, I think it's good that we're starting with just New York City. It's, it's not that big. And you get less resistance there. Right. Because uh, hopefully the lobbyists will go their, their radar screens and then by, by the time they recognize it, hopefully the same way what happened with the iPod and music and <laughs> movies, <laughs> it's too late already. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, say a little bit more about how the statistics information is used in, the, in your uh, uh, winning application? Statistics? Yeah, statistics. Yeah, so what we did is, so not only did we extract the metadata, is we sampled each data set. And we sampled it for the unique values, for the sparseness of the data set. So there are certain data sets like the 311 data set. What does sparse mean? Meaning, if they, they, they would have this data sets that you know all the primary primary keys are filled, but then all the you know all the other. So codes. so that's actually a bad property. Hmm? That's a bad property. Yeah, yeah. We were okay, yeah. so we were characterizing the uh, yeah. the, the, the data sets. Yeah. So we, we came up with scores. Yeah, complete. Yeah. 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 We then we scored each one based on okay how sparse it is and how the you know then simple how fresh it is and then there's a simple rule that gets kicked in that uh, we use uh, on the broker. We have about, from the 900 data sets, we compiled about 2.5 million facts about the 900 data sets. And then using the query interface, the developer can ask, give me all data sets from this agency about this thing that somehow mentions uh, that it's in the Bronx. Right? So without you wading through the data or downloading this multi-gigabyte data sets, just by looking at the characteristics of the extra metadata we derive, you can say, okay, there's no data here about the Bronx, and I'm only interested in doing Bronx data. So you don't need to go through that effort of going to that data. So we try to help, hopefully, innovate, accelerate the open data guys, developers, in, in doing their work. So the rules are man-made, like made by you, or? Uh, well, yeah, we just came up with uh, simple rules. Uh, right, subjective for now. rules, okay. But in, unlike, unlike PageRank, <laughs> what we aim to do is not hide the algorithm. We will expose the algorithm. So because it's open, it's all open data. So people can say, oh, I don't know why my page, my, my, my rank is five because my, my staleness is this high and the weight of staleness is this. So it's not like a guessing game with SEO. Or why am I, oh, is it because I didn't use met, the metadata header or, or maybe did I link too much to this guy? Why I'm being penalized by Google, which is a guessing game, right? So. Just have a quick question. Uh -huh. uh, as you mentioned, there are like 120 agencies in uh, New York City, and uh, the data set number is like uh, about hundreds. I yeah, because this is just early days. So typically, what they do right now is Mayor Bloomberg gives the mandate, everybody gives sample data. So, you know, maybe this agency who owns like thousands of data sets, they give them one or two that might be useful. So is there any plan for getting the, uh, at least cataloging all the data sets, even though it may not be 
Right, uh, that's what the open data policy discussion is about now. Is just right now the deadline the city has put forth is by 2018, all the data should be up and running. So before 2018, the first milestone is they create the, the policy collaboratively with, uh, you know, with, with, with the public. And then they'll adopt that policy in September and publish it. And then they will mandate the agencies to observe those technical standards and guidelines. So they have certain milestones that they, oh, by this date, you have to be up. And if you're not up, you have to have a valid reason why you're not publishing this data. Follow-up question is about the data dictionary because most time when you are matching up data sets, uh, you need to have a very good understanding of data dictionary. Yeah. So, are you still taking any automations on that, on processing the dictionary, or you take uh, any just uh, entire thing has been done? Anyway? Uh, what we the, the reason why we uh, we think of NYC facets as a pit stop to what we want to do. Uh -huh. So we we started with collecting all the metadata, and the vision is say we collaborate with. Uh, with uh, somebody, they'll use the metadata to do some semi-automatic, uh, you know, mapping. But there still has to be some hand yeah. mapping that needs to be done. And then, then when something, so there will be an editorial process to, to do the, uh, you know, the ontology mapping. Yeah, because that's the most expensive side. Right. When we are publishing data set. Right. <coughs> yeah. I was browsing the NYC Facets website, and I noticed that you use um, technology called Tableau to help visualize and slice and dice some of the semantic data, which that's not part of SMW. No, it's not. The beauty of, 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 uh, of SMW is there's a rich ecosystem of all these visualization tools, right? I'm not a visualization expert, but there's Tableau, there's many eyes, there's, I'm sure Will will talk about D3 and all his good stuff that he's working on that you can just plug in, because ultimately they just start with data, right? And then as to how that fancy West Bank 3 map that you have, it's just coming from the data. So I'm treating that as a black box. What side was that? Tableau. Tableau software. The, the, the NYC Facets website. So did you use any other visualization tools? We, yeah, we you use like in other right, technologies. We use, we use Tableau, we use many eyes. Uh, we we fix SRF Bodicus, but I haven't contributed it back yet. We fix it. That's a visualization thing that I was my original contribution to SMW. So it's working now. Uh, we we fix a bit the uh, the chart uh, stuff that Yaron did, so we can have the hover thing. But you know what? There's this. Uh, you might want to look into it. I actually propose it for the Google Summer of Code that we come out with this O data connector for for SMW, because OData is like open data, so you can, and Tableau, for one, supports OData. So if you have an OData connector, it can just consume the data from your, from SMW directly, if we, if we, if we go ahead with that, with that suggestion. Anybody yeah. else? Thank you. Oh. Are there any other cities in New York attempting this kind of project? Oh, there are a couple of them. Uh, there's Seattle, where okay. Woken is. Uh, if, if you look at Soprata.com, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Boston, it, there's a wave coming up. And the beauty of being tied with NYC is because they have that halo and, you know, capital of the world status, and they have the law pass, uh, which is the leading law right now. It's, what they want to do is actually, with this open data day policy discussion, is come up with a standard that all the cities will follow. And I think the architect even wants to convene a working group to really formally submit the standard, perhaps after September, when they get they solicit all the opinion uh, 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 comments from the public. So September is the solicitation month. Until September. September is Thursday. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So just do NYC Open Data that .com, and that's where the wiki is, and it was just launched last week. There's a couple of other efforts. There is something called Scraper Wiki which is trying to get data from non-cooperating government agencies. Uh, basically what happens is that people write parsers for like all kinds of in the oddball formats that they you know, won't compete with the vendors. Uh, the other one is the UK government uh, mm -hmm. has an active effort. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I think they have more traction in the UK. Yeah. Yes. Bigger budget. <laughs> money. <laughs> money as well. <laughs> but the good thing is Bloomberg's backing this. Yeah. So he's putting his own money and he's he gets it because he did data for finance, right? That's where he made his money. So hopefully doing this for the, for, for government, you know, there will be a next renaissance of data. Uh, just one last thing before I leave. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, that I often compared to what happened in, what, in New York about 20 years ago. If you recall, in the 80s and the 90s, New York was a bad place to go. Right? Uh, you, you would avoid it, and all the stereotypes you hear are, were true. Don't go to Times Square and everything. And what, one thing they did around 1990, 89, is they started this program called ComStat, which is computer statistics. And what they did with that is basically they started compiling and correlating all these crime reports and making predictions on the data. And it all just started with basically charts on a wall, like this big. And they started getting it. I had actually, as luck would have it, when I first came here, came to New York, I was an engineer at this laboratory information management system, and we got to work on some of that with this system called Nitro, which is just narcotic investigation tracking of recidivist offenders. And it's amazing, once you start just looking at the data, and punching it and correlating the kind of predictions you can make. That, okay, this perf lives here, and there's this crime here, and then you can start making predictions on what's going to happen around that neighborhood. And with that, by the year 2000, the crime rate in New York City fell by more than half. Right? Some people say it's because Roe versus Wade was passed, and a lot of these bad actors weren't born. <laughs> How does it compare to crime rate drops elsewhere in the US? And other well, actually, areas? Comstat was started in New York. And then all the other police agencies started copying. Because the crime rates in all over urban uh, uh, US have been dropping. Right, right. And that's why they, the, some of the naysayers say it's because of Roe versus Wade. Because all the, you know, the irresponsible parents didn't go forward with have, raising bad kids. So, but anyway, maybe we could do the same thing with, with open data, right? If we now have information access to 911 reports, D11 reports, restaurant grades, uh, where the business permits are and all that, these things, you know, where the parks are, who, who, what's the salary of this guy, what's his position, who visited him on this day, you know, apart from eliminating all the FOIA requests, right, we can have like a FOIA portal for all these Freedom of Information Acts, you can enable all kinds of businesses and all kinds of things, you know, that people didn't think when they started Comstat 20 years ago, but would, would lead to the, you know, New York City being one of the safest cities in the, in the world. Thank you.